That's great, Coldplay. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, um, thank you, Secretary General. Thanks to our, our host, our Taoiseach, and um, so you speak so immodestly about our country. I found you to be a, a very modest man yourself. Um, they don't teach modesty at Rockstar School. Um, my wife sent me to modesty school. I'm fine now. In fact, I'm better than most people at it. Um, there is truth to be told, a kind of braggadocio at the center of the Irish psyche. You could call it small island syndrome, small rock star syndrome. But Irish people, we write ourselves into every story. Uh, I'm sitting there in Nashville with a great Johnny Cash and I'm telling him the Irish invented country music. This is not true. <laughs> An Irish kid working in a bar is telling you that we've more Nobel laureates per head of population than anywhere else. This is not true. The taxi driver today that brought you from Paris or Lisbon or Brussels or Berlin, he's telling you that the Irish saved civilization itself in the Middle Ages. Now this might be true. We genuinely believe that the United States of America is our colony. <laughs> you, you too. <laughs> um, you too were just at the Oscars, uh, failing to wrestle a little gold man out of the hands of a Disney character. And someone, I think it was The Edge, pointed out that the little gold statuettes were designed by a man from Roscommon called Austin Cedric Gibbons? This is true. Google it. We write ourselves into every story, like the European story. And this is what I want to speak with you about this afternoon. It's hard to imagine that Ireland could easily not have joined the EEC. But the Taoiseach, back then in 1972, Jack Lynch, has been proven right in his prediction that an Ireland in Europe would mean a better Ireland and a better Europe. And uh, thank you. And you know, I think Ireland uh, can be even more useful as Europe goes forward. It, Europe needs storytellers, and, and we are a nation of them. We're good at anthems too, if we've got a clear top line melody, uh, which Europe oh, hasn't always had, but if we've got the top line melody, we can, we can sing it out. Also, we get around. Um, as island people, we're very aware of our neighbors, not just our own, but Europe's, especially Europe's gigantic next door neighbor, Africa. And that might be important as the population of that magnificent continent gets to 2 billion by 2050. I am very proud that Irish aid budgets have roughly stayed the course, despite the duress here of the last few years. Incredible. 80% of Irish people who are hurting the hardest in the middle of this financial crisis supported maintaining our aid levels. And that makes me very, very proud to be Irish. Um, the Irish have an easy solidarity with the world's poorest because not that long ago, we were them. And were it not for good leadership, a lot of it in this room, um, recently we could have been again. Um, we've got our Taoiseach, our finance minister, uh, amongst others to thank for that. I find it hard to tell the Taoiseach to his face of my gratitude as he has told me to mine that he prefers Bruce Springsteen to you too. <laughs> now, I've explained to the man from Mayo that we are a long way from New Jersey. He just looks at me and says, you know, Bruce's people were from Mullingar, Bono? Did you know Bruce Springsteen was personally instructed by Irish nuns? Google that. Anyhow, I, I, I may be hurt, but deep down I understand as he understands when I thank Tanishta Eamon Gilmore for his role 
in, in getting us through our financial woes, and not only him. I now want to use a word that to this audience is the equivalent of letting off a stink bomb. The word is coalition, because it really has taken a lot of collaboration and compromise to get from there to here. And we have to credit the Labour Party and President Higgins for their part in this recovery. Real leadership has cost them real votes, and I personally appreciate it. May not make me popular around here, but, but I'm going to say it also. Europe has heroes on both sides of the aisle, Chancellor Merkel, President Barroso, President Van Rompuy, and the Kenny. But it also has President Hollande, President Minister, you know, uh, Minister Thorning Schmidt, and the man I found to be a tireless worker on behalf of the world's poor, and also a great European, Martin Schulz. Now, no one else is going to say that name in this building right now, are they? In fact, my microphone's just going off there. Um, so before it is, uh, I want to give an enormous, enormous shout out. The biggest shout out I have in my heart to the Irish people who A, were screwed, and B, fought back with dignity. Irish people don't bruise easily, but we do not like the feeling of being bullied. And when the public sector had to pay for the arrogance of private sector stupidity, we got both bullied and bruised, and that was not fair. In the end, we're coming through. I'd love to say it was the Troika, but I think, frankly, it was to spite the Troika. The way we see it, the Irish people bailed the Irish people out. <clears throat> um, capitalism can be a great thing, I should know. Um, it's taken more people out of poverty than any other system, but let's not bow down to it. Let's not make a golden calf of it. While it might not be immoral, it most certainly is amoral. It's a bit of a beast. It needs us to wrestle it, beat it into shape, give it instructions so it serves our values rather than the other way around. This is much like Europe itself. Europe still taking shape. This European experiment, and here we are in the Petri dish of the Convention Center, Spencer Dock Dublin, defining, designing, divining European purpose, European possibilities. None of these things are, are, are automatic, are they? I mean, it's the values we infuse it with. It's what we bring to it. It's what we make it. So what will we make it, Europe? Well, nearly 200 years ago since Victor Hugo foresaw a United States of Europe in which, I quote, wild tumult is transformed into order and animosity into love. Sounds a bit hippie, but I actually like the word love being used because I love Europe. For all our achievements, I love Europe. <clears throat> For all we miss, I love Europe. Nearly 60 years though, Near, since, you know, for all our achievements, nearly 60 years after the Treaty of Rome, we have to admit that Europe is still an economic entity that needs to become a social entity. Europe is still a thought that needs still to become a feeling. Europe is a thought that needs to become a feeling. Now, this, this is the point when right-minded or... Uh, Center-right-minded politicians start squirming in their seats. Oh my God, the rock star is going to start talking about his feelings. He's probably going to ask us to hug each other or something awful. One big European group hug started by the Irish, resisted by the British, and paid for by the Germans. <laughs> but look, look. <laughs> I noticed this translation, it does take a while. Um, but look, you lot that write the treaties and sign them, you know better than anyone that uh, treaties are not enough. These are the things that organize us, but they are not the things that define us. Our relationships are what define us. And, and relationships are the stuff of emotion, are they not? And I want just for a second to just allow myself to get emotional about the European project because just the fact that it still exists is an incredible thing to me because 12 months ago that didn't look so certain, did it? The euro and all. I'd pull out a euro but that would be a really bad photograph for me. Um, 
But I am very grateful that Europe exists. And I want to thank you all for holding on to it so tightly. Thank you all in this building. <laughs> Europe is a thought that needs to become a feeling. Because when Americans talk about their United States, they get all misty-eyed and emotional. I mean, even Irish people get misty-eyed and emotional talking about the United States. Why? Do we get emotional and misty-eyed when we think about Europe? And if not, why not? There are 54 countries on the continent of Africa, and the people who live in them call themselves Africans. How many of us call ourselves Europeans? You know, I think more of us would if we were united not just by bonds of interest, but by bonds of affection. If we cared more about each other, understood each other's pain, would we do something more to help each other? For example, when you see young people, nearly a quarter of them out of work, fighting for their economic future, what happens? Yes, you guys discuss what happens. You've got Prime Minister Rajoy just this week urging the EU to make structural reforms that will create liquidity in the Spanish economy. Maybe you will. But beyond that, where's the family's response? Where's our Europe-wide campaign to spotlight Spain, to encourage others to take their holidays there, to buy Spanish goods, listen to Spanish music, have you two make a flamenco album? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. You know what I'm talking about. Neighborliness. I can tell you what we do in Ireland. There's a word, mehl. Mehl. Is that the correct pronunciation? Mehl. It means the group, the village, help one another out, and, 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 and they help most when the work is hardest. In my experience, most Europeans are like that. We discover who we are in service to our neighbors. Chancellor Merkel, you, you said in 2007, we do not really need to give a soul to Europe. It already has one. Well, Chancellor, I agree, and, and maybe you agree, that we, we, we sometimes find it tough to show that soul. Um, I'd argue that the soul of Europe is most visible when we're facing outward. When we're facing inward, we're Irish, you're German, you're French, you're them, we're us. Of course, we're not always going to agree. That's democracy. But facing outward, that's when we become one. That's when we're Europe. Manly Europe, in a gender-neutral kind of way. Uh, manly uh, Europe in leather, pointy leather, Spanish leather, pointy Italian shoes, English tailored suit, French shirt, driving a German car with an Irish sense of the rules of the road. <laughs> we see traffic lights as advice. <laughs> Um, but seriously, when we unite around something bigger than ourselves, like, for example, the Eurovision Song Contest? No. Uh, the Champions League? No. No. When we behave like champions in Brussels, like last year, when the Parliament, President Barroso, many of you here, I'd like to especially mention our own minister, Richard Bruton, because you did something remarkable. You passed an anti-corruption law requiring oil and gas companies to make public what they pay for mining rights so that in poorer countries, more of the wealth under the ground ends up in the hands of those that live above it. <laughs> Champions, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. And now, right now, you're working on an anti-money laundering law, one that demands shell companies and trusts to tell us who actually owns them. So corrupt monies cannot be hidden away. There's a transparency revolution happening, and Europe is at, this, at the forefront of it. This is daylight. Without it, you cannot fight the corruption that keeps the poor poor, and you cannot fight the secrecy that keeps the corrupt rich. If anyone wants to see how this plays, if anyone wants to see how this plays when you've got no transparency, you might ask our Ukrainian friends. We've all heard about Yanukovych. He's not Irish, by the way. Um, we've all heard about Yanukovych and his vast, opulent mansion, which might make even a rock star um, blush a bit excessive. You may have read Global Witness and a Ukrainian NGO 
are reporting that, that this palace, this palace was part owned by an anonymous UK shell company. Perfectly legal, perfectly corrupt. When Europe stops and exposes corruption, Europe reveals its soul. We have soul in Europe. We know there are other opportunities, and, and even in this election year, there don't have to be partisan issues. Things like a financial transaction tax, which could be used to fight extreme poverty and help unemployed young people in Europe and in Africa. This stuff is not left or right. It's not Irish or Frenchish. Neither are these issues African or Middle Eastern. They're human issues. And you, as you stand, and as you serve, you can make clear that these are European, Europe's concern and European values. And I might add, the G8 next year could be exactly the right place to make that case. 2015 is a very big year in the fight against extreme poverty, the redesigning of the new Millennium Development Goals into the so-called Sustainable Development Goals. It's a very, very big deal. Chancellor, um, you're the right woman to lead this. Um, you say it better than I can. Uke Sozial Markt Wirtschaft. That's not bad, is it? Uke Sozial Markt Wirtschaft. For those of you who don't speak German, uh, I, I believe that is uh, eco social market economy. Sounded like a German heavy metal band to me, but I, I love the idea of it. Um, so, to close, actual community or bollocks community, real neighborliness or people bound together by red tape speaking Eurobabble. Does this sound soft to you, Irish blarney to you? Because it's not. It's hard, and you know it's hard. It's hard in concept, and it's even harder in execution. Let us remember where the idea of one Europe really came from. It is prescient this afternoon to do so. What Winston Churchill in 1946 called the tragedy of Europe, the alternative, he said, to tearing each other to pieces was to recreate the European family, or as much of it as we can, and provide it with a structure under which it can dwell in peace, in safety, and in freedom. Virgil's words, aren't those still the stakes this afternoon? And don't, are we not seeing the rise of extreme nationalism again? Not the kind of nationalism of, I'm proud to be Irish, which I am, but you know the kind of nationalism I'm talking about, the ugly kind, the primal hate, especially when times are tough. We see Europeans turning against Im immigrants, migrants. We see people turning against Roma, searching for scapegoats. Sometimes it's a Jewish scapegoat, sometimes it's a Roma, sometimes it's African, sometimes it's gay. National, nationalism, extreme nationalism, isn't choosy. It's an equal opportunity hater. And it's not welcome. And make no mistake, its real victim is the idea of Europe, the idea behind Europe, because Nationalism like this depends on the idea of purity, and Europe depends on this idea of plurality. I want to argue that Europe can't just be a logical alternative to nationalism. It must become an impassioned one, an affair of the heart as well as the head. Our plurality needs to show itself with purpose, like that Gaelic word, miha. We hear that ideal by many different names from the young European activists who are telling us, telling you, to stand by the poorest of the poor. Activists like the youth ambassadors of the One Campaign, who, Chancellor, you met this time last year. There's now nearly four million One Campaigners uh, around the world. So you'll be hearing from them on your campaign trail. And, uh, you know, we hear that ideal also from the activists who risked their lives, and in some cases lost their lives, in Maidan, in Independence Square, in Kiev. 
One of those activists had made a handwritten sign that I read. It said, Europe starts with you. And she stood alone, this young woman. I believe her name was Anastasia. She stood alone with her sign, Europe needs, starts with you, beside a monument in a dark, cold November, before the violence, before the crowds had even started to build. Europe starts with you. That's what she wrote. That was her challenge to her fellow Ukrainians. But the challenge is not just theirs, it is ours. In that speech in 1946, Winston Churchill looked back at the collapse of the League of Nations, the well-intentioned instrument that failed to keep its peace. The League of Nations, the great man said, did not fail because of its principles or conceptions. It failed because these principles were deserted by the state who brought it into being. Nearly seven decades later, we know Europe is strong, and Europe can be stronger still. Our principles will not fail us, but in the spirit of Sir Winston, let us not fail our principles, because the world needs Europe, and Europe starts with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.